Before we get started, if you want to support me, check out DC Music School, check out my courses on Sound Slice, and I do have a book on gypsy jazz picking that's available on Amazon. Search my name in gypsy picking, you'll find it. All right, let's get started. Hello everyone from Taipei, Taiwan. I just arrived here from Tokyo a few days ago. As many of you know, well, those of you who follow my channel anyway, or my Instagram or whatever, I was stuck in Taiwan during the whole pandemic. And as soon as the opportunity presented itself for me to, to leave, to resume my life, basically, I, I left. And I suddenly left uh, last year in April of 2022 to go to Japan. And in doing so, it was just a sudden move. I left behind a lot of things, this guitar, this amp, and other guitars that I need to, to uh, reclaim. And yeah, that's why I'm here. And apparently if I stay long enough, I can potentially uh, get permanent residency. So that eventually, if or when China takes over, I can actually say that I've been to China before. Okay, so today's video is a continuation of what we did last week where I was talking about transcribing solos. Which solos to transcribe, the ones you like, and how you should transcribe them. Because as I said last week, not all solos are equal in terms of educational value. And a lot of the education that you might be able to receive depends on your current skill, skill level and your ability to learn. Now, as I've said in previous videos, anyone can learn how to learn. But with that said, some people are at different stages. So you get different things out of different solos. And as I said last week, Django solos can be a little bit difficult to, to understand or to absorb in terms of studying because his solos, a lot of his solos anyway, tend to be very, very conceptual. Obviously, every player has their own patterns, licks, or whatever, but Django uses those patterns and licks and whatever in a very conceptual way. And this solo is no exception. So this is Dinette. I think the 1947 version where he played on an electric guitar. So a, lot, a few different things to talk about. I'll try to talk about different things from different layers. This is one such solo where it will be quite difficult to take lick A, lick B, lick C. It's more of a, a general thing. And this is one of many solos that he's improvised where it's really telling a story from beginning to end. But let's start with the song itself. Dinette is actually based on the song called Dinah, uh, an American standard. And what's very, very peculiar about this song is that for the melody, uh, the melody is implying a number of changes that the rhythm section in this recording anyway is, uh, is, uh, is playing. So you have this thing where it goes A flat. I didn't bother to verify, so I could be wrong. Then it goes to D flat, so it goes. E9, and then after B flat minor to E flat 7, to A flat. Okay? Those are not the changes to uh, Dinah, but these are the changes that Django is implying, and for the melody, the rhythm section is copying these changes. And this has to do with something that I call harmonic direction that you might have heard me talk about in many in my many of my videos. This is one of the key concepts that any serious improviser needs to understand in order to to really understand jazz. This is a, a key concept that is often misunderstood, not always taught. And a lot of people who go to jazz schools, graduate from jazz schools, never knowing about any of this. And that's often how I can tell just by ear when I hear someone play whether they've actually listened to jazz or not before or really seriously studied it rather than going to school and learning a bunch of formulas. So harmonic direction is this idea where obviously it's important to know the changes, but what is more important is to understand where the changes are going. It's more of a general, if you look, if you zoom in, you see the individual chords. When you zoom out, you see the overall direction. And basically, it's, a, it's kind of like a balance between two things, tension and resolution. And the most obvious source of tension would be the five chord, and the most obvious source of resolution would be the one chord. So it's thinking in terms of that. And when you think of that in a broad uh, fashion, you, are, you will then be able to imply all sorts of passing chords and substitutions. And that's what all the best impro improvisers 
since the beginning of jazz have been using um, as a way to improvise over songs rather than looking at e each an individual chord as uh, as being equally important. I do have a course on my sound slice page, a harmony course that talks in detail about all this. You should really check it out. And guess what? Volume one is free. Maybe you should get two of those. Uh, but if you really want to support me, man, please buy it because this is my only source of income. I do these YouTube videos as a way to promote the things that I sell. And it would really mean so much to me if you could support my livelihood because things are not easy. Uh, luckily, things are stable, but it's the pandemic changed my, my life and um, everything's upside down. Any support you can offer would mean so much to me. Leave a comment, like, subscribe, etc. Thank you so much. Okay, so harmonic direction. So this is a case of harmonic direction. The original version of uh, Dinah would be A flat for four bars. So five. That's the A section of Dinah. And in Dinet, Django in the melody is implying all sorts of different passing chords. So A flat, D flat seven, C minor. Uh, B minor or B minor 6 if you want, E flat minor, so that, all these different things happening in the melody. But guess what? During the solo, the rhythm section switches back to Dinah and Django is improvising over Dinah. So this is very interesting from a historical perspective because nowadays when people play the song Dinet in Gypsy Jazz Circles, they play the changes uh, that are the play the the changes of the melody with all the substitutions and people improvising over that. So that's the difference between Django Reinhardt and modern gypsy jazz. But one great hint already from just the melody alone is that let's say you're playing over Dinah with the simple chords, you as an improviser can imply all these um, passing chords in your improvisa improvisation while the rhythm section is playing the simple chord progression, and that will create this effect of harmonic direction whereby the solos uh, the chord changes that you're implying don't match the rhythm section's chords but eventually they land where they need to land they meet at one point there's the resolution the tension and resolution so about this solo um it is more about storytelling and melody than licks so he starts with this thing uh before the bar line, he starts on a pickup, like a, a pickup that starts one bar and one beat ahead of the start of the chorus. So a one, two, three, four. That's one. So that's a very interesting thing to look at. So this solo, like I said, is not necessarily good for beginners. It's more because it's full of philosophical stuff, concepts. But bear with me, we'll talk about beginner stuff eventually as well. But pay attention to the start of the phrasing and the where they end. So this starts one whole bar and one beat before the beginning of the chorus. And it's pretty clear. It's just a melody. So. He's playing a melody based on these chords. A flat, A flat major 7. Right. Two, three, four, one. Uh. So then, then the next phrase starts on the end of two. So uh, what's very typical among beginners, especially in gypsy jazz, is to start your phrases always on beat one, play in a kind of like a square phrasing kind of way. Whereas here, the phrasing is less predictable. So starting on the the first phrase, starting on the beat four, a bar. In one beat before, and the next phrase is anticipating the the third bar by two beats and a half. One, two. This is bar three. And then you have this phrase where it crosses the bar line. It it uh, it connects chords from A flat to E flat. Where it's thinking kind of this E flat nine or B flat minor chord. And I also want to say something about uh, the time feel of this. Obviously, I'm playing Django solo, but I'm playing with my time feel and kind of my interpretation. I tried to get as close as I could to the way he played it, 
But I am me, Django is Django. I'll never be able to copy 100% what Django does with his inflections and things. There are some little per pe peculiarities with his time feel in this solo. And it, it I, I wouldn't, I don't want to use the word flaw, but like there's, there are these little imperfections in the solo. When you listen to it casually, it sounds perfect. But if you study it, like if you're practicing it the way I was practicing it, listening to it very carefully, you notice these little hesitation, rhythmic hesitations here and there. And for me, that means that he's really in the moment. He's nothing's really prepared. And that's what makes it really, really cool in my opinion. You'll have access to a transcription to this solo on SoundSlice. Check out the link in the, in the comment. But also, please listen to Django's version. See if you can hear some of these little nuances, rhythmic nuances. Okay. Uh, Namely, when he plays this B-flat, um, I hear a little bit of a rhythmic hesitation on his part. Because it's normal. It's just like, it's so in the moment. But like I said, when you zoom out and you listen casually, you don't notice it. I'm just talking really from a nerd kind of point of view because a lot of times jazz students have this idea that all solos that are recorded are perfect, which is not the case. And I'm reminded of something that Dan Wilson said when we were recording together. You should check out the lessons on DC Music School. How's that for advertisement? But, you know, he, we'd record like a whole bunch of tunes and I'd ask him, hey, are you satisfied with that take? You know... I made some mistakes, but that's human. And that's a great lesson, lesson to learn. You know, maybe you didn't play what you intend. Maybe, uh, and maybe what you didn't intend to play works. Maybe it doesn't work. But you know what? Whatever. Just continue. And some, most, of, most of the time, depending on what the mistake was, most people probably wouldn't even pick up on it. Because as I've said in previous videos, I've transcribed or investigated so many solos and I notice all sorts of imperfections. And I see often on the internet people on going on forums like, hey, what is so-and-so thinking on this? I don't understand this. And maybe there's nothing to understand. Maybe they're, they had an idea. They didn't know where they were going. They went somewhere, took a risk. And uh, theoretically, maybe it didn't work out, but it didn't sound terrible, so they kept it. That's something that you have to accept and that you have to understand when you're studying other people's improvisations. It's improvisation. It's just like speech. Very few people speak perfectly like a robot. If we did, we'd sound like Siri on the iPhone or something. Even myself, like I have these hesitations, you know? So there we go. So what I like a lot about this first A and even the second A is that he's soloing in a very, very melodic way, almost like a violinist ten would tend to solo, like Grappelli. He's obviously very aware of what the chords are, but he's not thinking, all right, A flat major, I need to play this lick. Oh, B flat minor, I need to play. Right, where it's like, all right, it's very clear, that's the chord. No, it's just a melody. Right? So, uh, as, as, a, as a student, what what will be could be really good when you listen to this solo is just to try to absorb these the melodicism of the solo rather than oh he's playing the flat nine the sharp nine the major seven just try to listen to it so much be aware of the harmonies and just absorb the general melodicism okay then the second part starts on beat four one so again the phrasing is not always starting on beat one Again, same thing, very melodic. And then you have this over the 2 5 1. It's like a bluesy phrase. Bluesy. It's not outlining the chords in a very obvious way, like that kind of thing, right? Just melody, blues. Okay? Then you have this B section that's very interesting where he's playing this. Uh, thing that kind of goes out there. So over F minor, he's playing F melodic minor. So conceptually, you can work on melodic minor over F minor in ascending fashion. So 
as a concept, that's an idea right there. You can use over a minor chord, think melodic minor, ascending. But then he goes, he ends up here. And what the heck is he thinking? So in the recording, I think there's an accent because keep in mind, the guy only had two fingers, right? And these, he used these for chords. And something, there's kind of maybe a technical glitch happened. If you listen carefully, he plays these notes. It sounds like he's playing A minor 6. But I have reason to believe that he actually meant to play this. Which is actually a C7 chord. With a flat 5, is it? Yeah, flat 5. With, and also a sharp 5. So, it's like coming off the whole tone scale. So, it's this idea of adding a passing chord. F minor to C7, F minor. So, the B section is basically 6 bars of F minor, then after E flat 7. So, it's 8 bars in total. So, because you have such a, you have those F, that F minor chord that lasts a long time, often the rhythm section can do things like this. F minor, C7, F minor, C7. And in his solo, that's what Django is doing. He's going F minor, then after C7, and then uh, voice lead, F minor, 9. And here, it's a scale, and if you want to call it something, it's actually Dorian. So then, okay, if you're playing a solo of F minor, Descending. That's an idea right there. There, I'm using modes. <laughs> and then he plays E. Like this E, 7 sharp 9. Where does this fit in, you might ask? I think he's thinking this. Which is a substitution. Like, so over the part where it goes two bars of E flat 7 going back to A flat, he divides it in two. E7 to E flat 7. So, with this funky chord. And then. So this triplet thingy, three, one. So this is an E flat nine chord, A flat six nine. That's what it does. Okay, so that's very, very interesting. The final part has this other bluesy lick where again, there's a little bit of rhythmic hesitation. I think, um, I don't, like I said, I don't want to call this a mistake, but it's it's just so in the moment that it, that when you analyze it, when you listen very carefully, there's actually you're gonna detect some little hesitation here. So he does this thing. Uh, so it's a blues, it's a blues idea. It's a bluesy thing. So learn some blues. <laughs> and this last one is very interesting. So it's Again, it's a bluesy effect. Um, theoretically, I mean, you can call it playing what? You can call it playing like A flat minor over A flat. So when you're in the key of A flat, whether you're on the major chord or the, the dominant chord, you have this little effect. And I think I showed this pattern in my Gypsy Jazz picking book that is now available on Amazon. It's apparently a number one bestseller in new releases for the guitar category. Check out that book. So that's a very interesting idea. And then after he has this kind of like a turnaround phrase. That's a typical Django pattern. And that, there we go, is the entire solo. So it's less about licks and more about storytelling, uh, implying different kinds of harmonies and concepts. F as a beginner, the thing that I would try to get maybe, or maybe just this phrase, play with this. So if you're in the key of A flat. So if you're playing a song like Coquette in the key of D, you can play with that idea. Honeysuckle Rose in the key of F. Okay, another useful thing maybe is from this chord thing. So again, if you're in, the, in, in a song like Coquette and you have A7 in the B section going to D, well, you don't have to take that rhythm, but you can just do. 
practice this. Something that you can just copy and paste right away. So that's an idea right there. But otherwise, a lot of the things there in that solo tend to be more on the conceptual side of things. It's a solo that I would recommend uh, students learn once their ears are a little bit more developed so that you, you can just absorb the, 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 the sound rather than the licks. So in the first two A's, you notice besides the ending of the, the second A where he's doing some bluesy thing towards the very end, it's really very much diatonic in the key. And pretty much just, if you want to call it the A flat major scale, but thinking in a very melodic way while being, being, being very aware of the chords. So that's an important lesson in itself. Something like that. <laughs> okay, although I just played an arpeggio there. But yes, awaken your melodic sensibilities. It's I can't stress that enough. And then the B section, you have this idea of playing F minor and C7, but also having ascending F melodic minor and descending Dorian. So you can maybe uh, practice like uh, your uh, over an F minor playing uh, F melodic minor. And notice that he starts on the note C. So you can start on the note C. What did I do there? I started on the note C. I went up melodic minor and then went down Dorian. And that kind of sounds in that style the Django style uh, okay yeah and then also over that uh, E flat chord you have this E7 so if you're playing another song like uh, uh, Coquette in the B section you have this part where it goes E7 then A7 but maybe you can divide it in half you can do so this B flat 7 A7 Last A is a bluesy thing, where you play more as a, it, it's not really 100% implying the changes, but you're playing with the, the blues sound, but still resolving when you need to resolve. So it's a very interesting solo. I don't know if you like it. I think I love it. Um, check it out if you want. But uh, it's something a lot of guitar players, jazz guitar players can learn from because a lot of guitar players, jazz guitar players, tend to be guilty of uh, kind of playing too many leaks, myself included, and also being too obsessive about the individual chords. And Django obviously was thinking about the chords. In fact, if you check out other solos, you can tell that he had a very, very strong innate understanding of harmony, but he never uh, forgot this melodic sensibility that often horn players or violinists have as well. And he knew how to mix the two very well. And that's what, in my opinion, makes Django solos sometimes very difficult to, to study in terms of acquiring vocabulary. It's, like I said, I'm repeating myself, sorry, but it's not about taking lick A, lick B, but about understanding how he, under how he has these little patterns and how he turns these patterns into actual music that makes sense if you look at the overall solo. Another thing that I would say if you try to attempt this solo, try to, I already talked about the nuances of the rhythm, but try to play this solo with conviction. Don't just play the notes, you know, but put some conviction into it um, with the right hand, with the left hand, vibrato, slides, accents. Like sometimes it can be legato, sometimes it's staccato. No? I'm not saying that's what Django does, but when yourself try to add something to it, like make it musical, don't don't be just like you know, put some energy into it. Okay, let me know what you think. Happy birthday, Django!